Well, I was hoping Carlos would leave my speech on the, uh, <clears throat> the podium, but of course he didn't. It reminds me, in this election season, Carlos, of a story, apocryphal, I must say. Years ago, there was a member <clears throat> of the United States Senate who, like a lot of members of the United States Senate, determined to want to run for president. Well, unfortunately for him, his staff detested him. I always thought, you know, I've never was a staffer, but I always thought, you really know your boss if you worked with him or her on a daily basis. And if you detest that person, I would expect the voters wouldn't like him or her very much either. But at any rate, purportedly, he went to his speechwriter and he said, I'm going to announce for president, and I'd like to have you write the speech. And he said, well, Senator, I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but nobody on your staff likes you. <laughs> Probably everybody in the country will dislike you. The likelihood of your being elected is, you know, like a Somali pirate being elected. This is not going to happen. He said, okay, okay, okay. But this is something I want to do. I mean, my ego is supreme, and this would be cool, and gosh, flashing light bulbs, and blue lights, I want to do it. Would you, all right, he said, I quit. No, 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 before you quit, would you write my speech? And the guy said, all right, I'll write your speech, and then I quit. He said, okay, that, that you're on. So he went to the Senate formal chamber. There's a big glittering room where a lot of these candidates announced their candidacy for the president, presidency in years past. And he had his speech in front of him that his aide who now has quit, wrote, and it went something like this. There are those who say the problems of this country are insolvable. I say they are not, and I have a plan. And he turned the page. There are those who say the problems of the inner city are insolvable. I say they are not, and I have a plan. There are those who say the problems of education are insolvable. I say they are not, and I have a plan. He turned the page and said, you're on your own now, you miserable son of a <laughs> <laughs> So now that is, you tell you that, that is a real hero to the public that somebody found this guy out and put him in his place. You know that when Ken and Carlos asked me to speak briefly to you all, I thought, you know, this is election day today, all sorts of problems out there. And I remember several weeks ago, I'm a Republican, I remember several weeks ago, I was invited uh, to present <clears throat> the several former governors in front of a whole bunch of people who were fundraisers um, and several current senators. I won't mention the senators' names, they were members of the party of Lincoln, and they were all there, <clears throat> and so they asked me to introduce the governors, several of the governors who were in attendance and about the issues that we thought were important. Then they called upon the current members of the Senate. I think there were four of them. They had a spokesman. If I mentioned his name, you would know him. He's a wonderful person. And what he said was, we need to address the problems of the country. And everybody is waiting, and? And then we need to bring people together to address the problems of the country, and? The point I'm making is today both parties tend to focus on politics instead of policy, thinking that if they avoid policy, they will be able to embrace a successful politics. Maybe that is true, but Carlos and Pam know when I had been up here working for Ronald Reagan and George H.W. supervised, I'm a former FBI agent and U.S. attorney, so I supervised the Secret Service, the ATF, Customs the U.S. Marshals, Interpol, all the U.S. attorneys. So my background was largely uh, law and law enforcement. But at any rate, I went home, no surprise. The House and Senate in Oklahoma, heavily, overwhelmingly Democrat. Um, they used to search us out, Republicans, on Saturday night with their headlights. I mean, this was, now today, Oklahoma, the last three or four years is pretty red. But in those days, not so. So I figured the one thing public policy cannot have is treading water. There is no such thing as a tr treading water public policy. <clears throat> so you figure out, well, what ails this place? And I looked at Oklahoma. My grandfather's a banker, Democrat member of Congress from Illinois. I come from a very bipartisan environment. 
Growing it up in Oklahoma, obviously, if you're a Republican, you better be bipartisan because there weren't very many, many Republicans. But nonetheless, I sat there thinking, how does a Republican governor, only the third in the history of the state, to this day the only one reelected? Today, my lieutenant governor, Mary Fallon, will be reelected, the fourth Republican governor reelected, or the fourth Republican governor, but the second one reelected. But anyway, I thought, how does it, how do, do we address the problems facing the state? If I say our problem is X, the Democrat House and Senate will say, no, no, it's Y. And if you say it's X, it's only because you and your right-wing friends like the Heritage Foundation and Cato say that it's X. So sometimes we stumble into pretty good decisions. I asked the state chamber to examine through Oklahoma State University's economics department and Oklahoma's economics department, why are we poor? We were 45th in per capita income. Why are we poor? So what came back, and you never know what's gonna come back when you ask academics to analyze something, but what came back was not larger classroom sizes or need to have more social promotion or whatever it may be. It, they came back and said, you don't have right to work you tax everything, the trial lawyers run this place, you have welfare, the kids don't take hard enough courses in school, the transportation infrastructure sucks, and you have too much divorce. Now, not from a religious standpoint, it was just from an economic development standpoint, families that break up early, both of them are impoverished. You know, the, the woman or man with a child, I mean, this is not good. So I went to the pro tem and the Speaker of the House, and I said, okay, here it is. We gotta do all these things. In eight years, by the time I left office through a Democrat House and Senate, we got rid of welfare, we limited punitive damages to double actual damages in civil litigation, we made the kids take three years of math, four years of English history and science, charter school and choice, we built out the infrastructure connecting every town of 10,000 and more by a four-lane highway to the interstate system, we put right to work in the Constitution. We started the first marriage initiative in the country. My fellow governor at the time, George W. Bush, borrowed it nationally to encourage strong lifetime marriages. Not every marriage is gonna survive. My older brother was divorced. My, I just lucked out marrying Kathy. But we moved from 45th per capita income to 37th by the time I left office, and oil never went above $18 a barrel. Now, oil is about 7% of the state's income. Now, what does that say? That a Democrat House, Democrat Senate, if you give them an agenda with somebody who will close the door and say, let's get this stuff fixed, can get it fixed. So I think about what ails America, and I think about these Republican senators, all of whom are bright, speaking not even in generalities, but speaking about we need to solve the problems. Just like my speech in that magical, mystical, mythical senator there was nothing in it. I have a plan, you're on your own now, you miserable. I mean, that is what really concerns me from both parties. But they've learned a lesson from you and me, and that is you get specific and you die. Truth is, I was on the Rivlin Diminishy De Deficit Panel. You all know numbers. This organization represents the leaders in American communities. You all are leaders in the American communities. You heard. You know, Carlos is a classic example of somebody who's on every board because his financial expertise and his, his intelligence and goodness are sought after. But in any event, I was on Rivlin Domenici, the de deficit panel. I did a lot of the tax stuff. And what stunned me is this is a full service scandal, Republican and Democrat. In 1789, I did a number of children's books, one of them, for Simon and Schuster on George Washington. But in 1789, when Washington became president, to the year 2000, when George W. Bush became president, the national debt was $5 trillion. $5 trillion. Took all those years to build it up to $5 trillion. When George W. Bush began office and when George W. left office, it just about doubled to 10, a little less than 10, about nine plus. This guy's doubled it again, a little short of like maybe $18 trillion now. Now, what does that say? Both parties figured they could buy the present with the future. So the country, those numbers are calamitous. 
I mean, 17, 18 trillion dollars, the national debt. The only thing that's saving us, as everybody knows in this room, are low interest rates. So when those rates become more market rates, then who's going to pay all this stuff? Look at the condition of some of the states. And we are merrily going to probably reelect some of the worst offenders today for putting debt upon debt upon debt. And for those of us, like Kathy and me, we have 10 grandchildren from 2 to 12. To say that we're going to jeopardize their future because of our selfishness is utterly irresponsible. So we presented a, propo a proposal, and that was to dramatically reduce rates from 39.6 to 25, personal income tax rates, to consider idle income and earned income, people who go out and work, whether it's cap gains, interest, or dividends, the same rate, everything at 25 percent, basically a, uh, a flat tax. But guess what we did? We proposed to get rid of every exemption, deduction, and credit. Well, that got a lot of attention. Would that pass? Get rid of mortgage interest deduction? Well, let's make it a tax credit. Very low, but a tax credit. How about charitable contributions? Oh, we can't do that. How about in the energy business depletion? How about in the life insurance industry inside buildup? The only way you get tax reform is put everything in into a revolutionary package that says we reduce rates from 39.6 to 25. You get rid of the deficit in three years, and you go toward long-range reduction of the national debt. There is no discussion whatsoever about either the president's uh, Simpson Bowles Commission or the Ribbon Diminishing Commission. None. No Republican talks about it. No Democrat talks about it. Now, what brought us the crisis in the fall of 08? You can read and you can debate, but what brought us the crisis in the fall of 08 is people didn't underwrite loans. I mean, imagine when I went to try to buy a house, when I left the FBI, moved back to Oklahoma as a prosecutor. I got turned down for a loan. I, I wanted to buy a duplex. Kathy and I had not met then. I wanted to buy a duplex, rent one side, live in the other, and I would live happily ever after. I'd mow the grass and, you know, all that good stuff, but I'd have a piece of the American dream. The bank turned me down. At the table, there was not a mortgage broker who was only paid if he approved me. At the table was a banker who said, look, we have no doubt Heck, you've been in law enforcement. You'll try to pay your bills. But if you have that other side unrented, you and we are in trouble because we don't want to take the place back. I said, what can we do? What can I do? He said, have your dad co-sign the note. I said, absolutely not. I'm never going to do that. Okay. Then have the owner-seller collateralize the first $5,000 of the loan, which the owner-seller did do. I moved in that place. Later, Kathy and I met. We set of housekeeping there, we sold it for a modest profit. Now, why did I tell that story? Because today, that loan would not have been approved by anybody, because that's not a QM loan. That's the, react, or the result of Dodd-Frank, 43% debt to income, no loan. Your dad co-signed a note, that's not QM. Owner-seller collateralized the first $5,000, that's not QM, so, you know, suck it up. Go do something else. Today, one out of three young people are living with their parents. I'm talking about people 35 and under, still living with their parents. Maybe one out of four, but it's closer to one out of three. And it's estimated, I got my first mortgage at age 27. This generation is going to get their first mortgage at age 37. Why? Because of QM, 43% debt to income, but student loan debt for a degree in blotting and erasing and advanced pencil sharpening. Now, that is a degree, but I'm saying, I'm saying that with good humor, but you have debt and deficit. You have enormous debt on individuals, particularly young people who can't afford it in many cases, and you've got a system. We've turned over basically the housing finance system to Fannie and Freddie again. The very people that insisted that you get of us loans when people don't have assets, jobs, or income. Now, Tell me, would you loan me money if I had no job, no assets, or income? The answer is no. Why did we do it in those days? Because the political class and not those who make jobs 
and make vitality happen, we're making the decisions. So you've got the issue of housing and finance, you've got debt, you've got the kids that can't afford to get a house, and unfortunately, just look at the education achievement of the kids in your states. Take a look at that. The number of children going to college who have to be remediated is anywhere from 25 to 30 percent. I taught, when I was governor, reading to kids who are graduating from high school that could not comprehend, they could read like they were newscasters. But you say, what did that say? I don't have a clue. So we spend huge amounts of money on public education, but in my own state of Oklahoma, for example, we have a Republican House and Senate. They repealed Common Core. The only thing to separate us from the people at the lowest end of the social and economic ladder, no rigor, repeal Common Core. And then there was another law that did not permit social promotion from third to fourth grade unless you were at the third grade level in achievement. And the legislature sent to the governor a repeal of that. She vetoed it, Republican governor, and they overrode her veto. Now, where is the leadership? And I think about the business community, everybody in this room, with kids that can't read, how do you compete? The whole issue of housing finance, the issue of titanic regulation, I don't care what the profession or occupation is, extremely expensive. In banking, for example, those of you who come from smaller communities, the community banks are the vice lifeblood of America. In banking, we have lost, in a gross number, one bank a day, every day, five days a week since the fall of 08. And not because they have been closed because of bad loans, they are being closed because people can't take it anymore. You know, anywhere from 10 to 20% of your operating income is to compliance. Can you imagine in this hotel, if 10 to 20% of what you're paying for this convention goes to satisfying the edicts of the DC Health Department, we would not have had a very good lunch because they'd have to cut way back on the quality of the food because of how much it costs to put it on the table. I mean, this is madness. And the thing that disappoints me, just like my Republican friends telling me all that they're going to do in generalities, or Democrat friends who are still trying to protect unsustainable pensions in many, many states and cities of the Union. When I was an FBI agent on the West Coast, in those days you had to be a CPA or a lawyer to be an FBI agent. I remember I had a buddy who was a detective, and he I was 27 probably, and he was roughly the same age. And he said, you know, all I had to have is a high school diploma to be a police officer here, and I retire at full pension in 20 years. And I didn't think about that at the time because, you know, 20 years seemed like a heck a 47-year-old was an old man. But, I, but you'll think about it. That was what the decisions were being made at that time, and they had been continued to make. And you look at the destruction of Detroit, you look at the what will be the destruction of Illinois unless they get control of their pension system, you think, how did this happen? It's because Republicans and Democrats weren't willing, as they did in Oklahoma, quite truthfully, to sit down around the table and close the door and say, you know, this whole thing is unsustainable. We are going to slide into the sea if we don't address this stuff. But I'll wager in your states we have not heard one word about what needs to be done to solve problems. Why? Because people are afraid of you and of me. If you mention you know, we're going to do something about Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. That's the buster of the budget. And to say that we're going to have a means test for Medicare, what's wrong with that? Well, I earned it. Really? My mother-in-law, God love her, who never worked a day in her life. Her work was to, raising kids, which is the hardest job. But she didn't ever have a pay stub. And I said to her, you know, Mom, you're a wealthy woman. It's just sad that you don't pay a little bit for that Social Security or a little bit for Medicare so that we can make sure for the poor we have it. She said, I earned every bit of that. Well, I never wanted to argue with my mother-in-law, and I did not that day. But you get the point. I mean, we all are deceiving ourselves by not, and, and I got to lay it at the feet of the president, but with both the, my president, the uh, Republican president, and the Democrat president, nobody wants to address problems. They just think, ooh, ooh, this will get us in trouble, whether it's immigration, tax policy, you know, dependency programs, safety nets. In 1950, the average person retired at 65 and died at 69. 
So everything was actuarially sound. Today, it's 62 and 81, 82, and everybody thinks we can't touch that 65, uh, or 62, really, age for Social Security partial retirement. I mean, where is the leadership to address these issues so we can have our children and our grandchildren survive in this society, the most prosperous, wonderful, free society in the history of the globe? I don't know. But today, hopefully, is the beginning of the beginning. And that whatever happens this evening, I'm really an optimist, always have been. I think everybody means well. It's just that hopefully, if the president wants a legacy, and I was over there when there were like four or five of us, and the president told me, we need, I need to get this immigration deal fixed. I need a legacy. Because you guys will repeal the Affordable Care Act. And I said, well, we'll do some you know, heavy uh, uh, amendment to it, because it needs to be. I mean, it, it, you really need to amend a law. Any law that's passed is not uh, infallible. Every, any law that's passed is a work of compromise. But if he would close the door, no matter what happens in the Senate today, and bring everybody in and say, my legacy is going to be to save the country, then maybe we'll ha accomplish the things that my 10 grandchildren need to be accomplished, and for us as adults must be accomplished for the sake of the future of our country. On that high note, thank you so much. And I didn't, I didn't mean to give you a lecture, but I really appreciate being included. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'll. Yes, ma'am. And I don't think they have a microphone, so you might face the audience to ask the Oh, there's one. I'm sorry. When you're the past chair, you're a worker bee. <laughs> thank you, Merv. Um, thank you so much for your comments. And I am from the state of Wyoming, and my past career is in banking. And I, um, I guess I thought that banks were in a little better shape. And then I heard a news uh, report about a week and a half ago that there are some large banks that are having some problems with stress tests. Could you speak to that a little bit? I'm, I'm worried that we may see another, like, 2008 kind of episode. Actually, in terms of capital, the American banks have never been uh, stronger. Big, small. Matter of fact, what we're trying to do, representing all banks, but certainly the community banks, is if you have a certain level of capital as a community bank, you don't have to go through all these Basel III tests. I mean, Here's an example of state regulation, and you guys obviously represent the best and brightest at the state level, as well as nationally, but when I represent the life insurance industry, it was solvency two. And our board came to me and said, are all the Europeans coming over here to tell us we have to sign up for this solvency two, higher reserves? And I said, yeah. And he said, you know why they're doing that? They don't want us in Europe. It's a competition issue. It has nothing to do with safety and soundness. So he said, well, can you tell them we're not going to do it? And he said, no, let, let, can, when they come to see you, can you tell them to go to hell? And I said, yeah. So they all showed up. And, you know, we needed their sales tax revenue. And nice to have them. I'm not kidding. It's true. And I said, I just want you to know you all are nice, but we're not going to do solvency too. We're state regulated. State regulators don't want to do it. And we don't need to do it. Everything is fine, so you all can go to hell. That's what my... <laughs> So they left and laughed, and I never saw them again. Think about the banks, Basel III. The, our regulators love the Europeans. You know, the Brussels comes over here. Banks now are getting rid of mortgage servicing. If you're in the banking business, you want to service mortgages. That's how you keep relationships with your customer. Banks are fleeing mortgage servicing because it requires a huge new increase in capital for you to do it because the Europeans say we have to do it. And we sit there, and we nod to this. I mean, it is beyond comprehension. And I'm not a jingoist. I mean, they, they've got beautiful buildings. You know, those cathedrals are lovely, and they have a lot of nice paintings. But to tell us a very different banking model, what we should model ourselves after them, where'd they come from? But nobody says that. You know, the Fed, FDIC, and the OCC, they're committed. But the capital levels of the American banks are really very good. The problem is if we go back into 
giving loans to people with no job assets or income, you can lose you know, your capital real fast. And hopefully we won't do that. But remember, there were all these regulators in place when this calamity began in 2005, 2006, or whatever. They, where in the world were those people? I guess looking out the window. Yes, ma'am. Another? Right here, sir. Thank you for speaking, Governor. Jason Sockwell, Washington, D.C., Board Administrator. What is your uh, opinion on the rapid proliferation of for-profit colleges, uh, the student loans that uh, many disenfranchised students take out to attend them, and the relatively low employment rates uh, that we're seeing uh, from them? From them. Well, see, I think that's a great question, and I can answer it by showing my ignorance by saying, you know, I'm a a private and public school product. I went to Georgetown University here and then to o Oklahoma University Law School, so I both. Our kids all went to public schools uh, here and in, in Oklahoma. So, you know, worked for Uncle Sam and worked for Uncle Will Rogers, and I didn't have the money to send them to, to private schools. I think there's a place for private colleges and, and there's a place for private student loans. The government owns, uh, makes, it owns 90% of, of the student loan market. I wonder if anybody's looked at their success. Um, I'm not sure. But if a, it, to audit loans and say none of your kids get jobs when they graduate, um, that's the reason you should go in and say you're out of our system. But have we done that sufficiently? You know, there are private schools that I think are very good and private lenders that are very good. There are public schools that are very good. Look at Michigan, Texas, some of the great universities in the world um, that are public. But I think to focus in on the 10% of the market that's private, the private student loans, and to say those are all bad and you're not doing a good job, how about the 90% the government's doing? And some of these schools, particularly online schools, a lot of kids, older students, there's the only way they're going to get an education is virtual, I mean, is online education. So I would look at what kind of employment rate do you get and survival rate. If you don't do a very good job of placing kids in jobs, then I would cut you off of the knees. But I mean, I don't know enough about the specifics of what works and what doesn't, but there's got to be a model there someplace. One, any, uh, I think your program starts, what, 1.30, Carlos? And, you got nine minutes to enjoy yourselves, but thanks for having me. It's been a real joy. Thank you.